next presenter previously taught philosophy at nearby Montclair State. Her big idea, the chopstick fork principle, asks us to be at least bicultural and charges us to have the courage and curiosity to distinguish generalizing from stereotyping. Please welcome to the arena, Kathy Baubeen. chance to talk about uh, Americanizing by the Toxic Sport Principle. And to do this, I ask that you make two assumptions with me. One, that uh, if you're a hermit, and you're not because you're here, you are at least bicultural and probably take several cultural journeys every day. All right? The second thing is that you don't understand the culture unless you understand its humor. So please, if you don't have a sense of humor, pretend. <laughs> now, I don't mean to pretend that you understand something that you don't, okay? But pretend you have the confidence to say, I don't get it. And in doing so, encourage other people to be a teacher. The second thing that you pretend is that you have the courage to recognize that there's a very, very fine line between dysfunctional stereotyping and functional generalizing. And sometimes that line curves around. Okay, so um, basically, I'm going to talk about my cultural journey. First, as an immigrant to the United States from China, and then as an emigrant from banana hood. That's yellow on the outside, white on the inside, okay? <laughs> now, as I talk about my cultural journey, I want you to think about yours. This is fair going into and out of neighborhoods, families, religions, moods, gangs, advertisements, countries, languages, religions, jokes, laws, fashion. So here's some of the facts and factors of my life. I was born in China in 1942. In 1946, uh, my parents, older sister Betty and I came to the United States, landed in Brooklyn. One day later, Betty and I were enrolled in public school number eight. I spoke no English, Betty could say lucky strike and shut up. <laughs> the principal let her skip two grades and made me do kindergarten twice. There was no ESL in those days. In 1941, we moved to Teaneck, New Jersey, where the school kids got off for Yom Kippur, Christmas, Easter, Rosh Hashanah, but not Chinese New Year. Uh, so I felt a little left out at that point. In 1960, I went to college where I majored in history, government, and screaming. <laughs> I, I should be doing this, I think. There. Uh, the screaming didn't get me on the, uh, uh, the lead role in the Diary of Anne Frank because the, di uh, the director didn't think a Chinese could play a two from Amsterdam. But it did get me on the Tufts cheerleading squad. And from there, this picture ended up in Sports Illustrated, clothed happily. <laughs> the reason I want you to see this is because there's a platoon of Williams College ROTC cadets behind me. Yay! Okay. <laughs> this is at a time when only 105 Chinese were permitted to immigrate to the U.S. per year. And that was by ethnicity, not by nationality. And you compare that with 15,000 that was permitted each year from the United Kingdom alone. So that's why I like this. Okay, in 1962, I heard Malcolm X tell my roommate she was no longer a Negro. She was a black woman. In 1964, I went to graduate school in California and learned how to philosophize and be my own matchmaker. There was no e-harmony in those days. <laughs> <laughs> one, month later, one month later, I met Bennett Bean, a Caucasian male who didn't wear socks and wanted to make art. He thought I was Japanese. <laughs> I went to Berkeley. There I met Bennett's friends. Most of them lived in hippie communes or nudist colonies. I became a Democrat. <laughs> in 1967, I was accused of being a prostitute in a large, in a big New York hotel 
because the concierge didn't know that women with long Chinese hair might actually prefer using their brains for a living. <laughs> um, the next year, I started teaching at Jersey City State for less money than I made as a waitress. Meanwhile, Ben, my husband, started teaching at a college that expected him to wear a suit in the ceramic studio. <laughs> One year later, we were both fired. <laughs> In 1970, we met Billy Burke. After her uh, stint as the Good Witch Glinda in The Wizard of Oz, she ended up being a real estate agent in New Jersey. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I didn't make any of this stuff up. Anyway, she pointed us toward Warren County, uh, where we bought an old farmhouse. The neighbors thought I was the maid. <laughs> One year later, I got tenure, so nobody could fire me again. But that was when the chairperson of the philosophy department asked me to make curtains for the office. Oh. Bad old days. So I resigned and became a feminist before I knew I was a Chinese-American. In 1973, I became a U.S. citizen. That's when the mayor asked me to be a Lenape Indian in the town's bicentennial parade. <laughs> in 1986, I turned 44 and didn't stop smoking because the hypnotist couldn't find my subconscious. So I opened up an aerobic studio. Around this time, my roommate became an African American. Now, what a cause. <laughs> but your brain doesn't have to be. Brain plasticity means that your mind can have control over what matters. So I want you to preface the facts I just mentioned by remembering that the only reason my Caucasian neighbors stereotypically concluded that I must be the maid, not the wife of the new homeowner, was because the only public images of Asians in those days were as maids and houseboys. You can deface the facts by demeaning maids and houseboys. It's a perfectly legitimate and honest way to, to make a living. You can interface the facts by believing that about 16,000 years ago, somebody walked across the Bering Straits, took a right turn, walked past where Sarah Palin was going to be, and <laughs> ended up in New Jersey as a Lenape Indian. So the mayor might have had a point. Uh, and you can reface the facts by the power of naming others and oneself, from Negro to Black to African American, from Beijing to Peking, back to Beijing. In 1993, Bennett, my husband, was invited to the White House. He wore pink sock sandals and a suit. This was Clinton's first uh, year in office, and he decided to have a White House collection of art. So he invited about 60 people, including Bennett, to be part of this collection. So I said, okay, Bennett, this is fabulous. We're going to the White House. You're going to have to wear a suit. He says, I don't care where I'm going. I'm not wearing a suit. I said, of course you're going to wear a suit. It's the White House. He says, no, I'm not going to wear a suit. So then I said the magic words, my mother. <laughs> my mother's going to want to see you in a picture with the Clintons in a suit. So he says, all right, I'll think about it. <laughs> so two days later, he comes up to my office, and he says, all right, I just rode away for a suit. So what do you mean you rode away like L.L. Bean? <laughs> Mail ordered a suit to go to the White House? He goes, oh, no, no, no. I just wrote Donna Karen. Dear Miss D.K.N.Y., I've just been invited to the White House and I have nothing to wear. I think you make beautiful clothes. I make beautiful pots. You want to swap? <laughs> think outside the box. Two days later, Ms. Karen calls and says, I would love to swap. <laughs> so we ended up at the White House, and it turns out that Clinton was wearing the same suit that Bennett was wearing, or the other way around. But Bennett refused to wear the shirt and tie, and happily, you can't see the pink socks and sandals. <laughs> so I framed this picture, and I give it to my mother, hoping she would be pleased. She doesn't look at the suit. She doesn't look at my dress. She points to Hillary Rodham Clinton and says, What's that around her neck? <laughs> and I said, well, they were blinking Christmas tree lights. She said, I cannot believe that the first, our first lady showed up in public wearing blinking Christmas tree lights. <laughs> now, we came to this country in 1946. That was 1993. That was the first time my mother ever, ever referred to the people in the White House 
an hour. So you may call to your journeys, but your mind, your heart, your guts, your body doesn't get there all at the same time. And sometimes, as I said, you go back and forth, back and forth. So this started me thinking about my mother's Americanization. I mean, it never would occur to her that anybody would look down on Chinese. We've been around for a few thousand years, okay? And yet, when she became a US citizen, she proudly stood in line in the rain to cast her first vote. So I decided that I would immortalize her um, Americanization with a t-shirt, because that's what you do. You point important things on t-shirts. <laughs> so the front of the t-shirt says, Empress Dowager. The back says, just another immigrant. Okay, again, that's the switching that happens. So now the idea is, how do we Americanize? And I think you Americanize by acting more, not less, like an immigrant. And you do it by the chopsticks pork principle, of course. So why, Im why act more? Well, if you are a good immigrant or a good traveler, you perceive the event as an opportunity to be a member of the so-called minority and to try to communicate in a language or style you were not born into, all right? And if you do the toxic sports principle and have a sense of humor, it truly lightens up the trip. So what is the toxic sport principle? Basically, look at the ordinary events. Bathroom etiquette, dining, <coughs> elevator behavior, first day at school, birthday parties, and see what is culturally extraordinary in those ordinary events. In other words, you learn to describe before you prescribe or proscribe. About 12, 14 years ago in the Washington Post, there was a headline, quote, 25% of U US view Chinese Americans negatively. My email mailbox just flooded with emails from all my Asian friends saying, there are a bunch of bigots here, it will never change, we'll never fit in, we'll always be outsiders, blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey guys, can we think about this a little bit? Any president would be ecstatic with 75% approval. <laughs> On any single day, 25% of your own family doesn't like you. <laughs> But that wasn't proof. But the knee-jerk response is to think that it's true in some ways that it isn't. So describe before you prescribe or proscribe. Of course, there's a moral hazard in provoking laughter that without care and intelligence. Yet good humor can be the first step onto a bridge that is built of all our public and personal lives and which extends into a shared future, whether we like it or not. And because multiculturalism seriously is like being PC, but not as a matter of suppression, but as a matter of being reluctant to hurt feelings. So let's be both daring and forgiving in order to learn and teach what is or is not funny. Now my father's favorite funny story is actually true about Wellington Boo who was a statesman and ambassador. In 1921, uh, while well, at a banquet in D.C., he was seated, seated next to a young woman who, after a few minutes of embarrassed silence, finally looked over at uh, Ambassador Boo and said, Likey Soupy? Oh. Since he didn't think of anything that could respond to that, he simply <laughs> continued eating his soup with a smile. Well, after the banquet, Wellington Gu was invited to the podium to give his after-dinner speech, which he, of course, did in absolutely perfect English. He goes back to his table, and as he's sitting down, he says, like he's speechy. <laughs> <laughs> now, any discussion of this incident must take into account that it happened in 1921, where there were only 62,000 Chinese in the whole country. What were the chances that this young woman in 1921 would have ever met a Chinese? Very slim. So jokes, funny stories can really be a venture into translingual, transcultural, and um, interdisciplinary thinking, all right, exploring. In other words, 
if you take multiculturalism seriously, there is no normal. There are few assumptions and few shared conclusions. Indeed, there's only one universal truth. Listen up. Regardless of culture, no father ever says to his daughter, please, marry an artist. <laughs> uh, I may not know what is true, but I do know when I'm lying. So when I have... <laughs> you're taking up my touch. <laughs> when I had my son, I didn't want to lie to him. So I had to make some serious decisions. One was about St. Nicholas, and the other was about the, the woman with the dental fixation. <laughs> so I decided to rename St. Nicholas the make-believe Santa Claus, and the woman with the dental fixation became the imaginary tooth fairy. And I'd like to read from my book. By the time William was five and shedding baby teeth, oh, it's here. I have another one there. Uh, <laughs> shedding baby teeth on a regular basis, I got an inkling of how the realities and fantasies were coexisting in his head. It happened one night when I took him to school with me. Driving home, William was trying some new technique to extract the latest casualty of growing adult teeth. I was too tired to cook. I was looking for a restaurant. He succeeded and I succeeded. Sitting in the restaurant, the Chinese waiter looked at the bloody incisor and said, will your grandparents buy it from you? Alert to financial transactions of any kind, uh, William was interested, but perplexed. He looked at the man, then down at the coup. I could guess what he was thinking. He knew the imaginary tooth fairy gave him real money for actual teeth. He knew my parents gave him red envelopes of money on special occasions. The question before the house was, what did one have to do with the other? Were they somehow in codes? <laughs> Quickly, I told the waiter in Chinese, we do teeth American style. <laughs> Tired, I wasn't up to going to the ontological status of fairies or the limited market value of baby teeth. <laughs> <laughs> the waiter left to get our tea and milk, having picked up on my desire to drop the subject. William did not. I don't understand. What, what did he mean? What did you mean? Overly casual, I let it out as fast as possible. In China, children get money from their grandparents. In America, they get it from the imaginary tooth fairy. His neck extended like a turtle, so his eyes could see my face clearly. His words were slow and deliberate. Who is the imaginary tooth fairy? Meeting ha him halfway so he could watch me even more closely, I said, who do you think it is? Then have it. Remember, it's the imaginary tooth fairy. And then flashed him a wink and a, this is a good joke if you're smart enough to get it. <laughs> Sitting back, he thought. No conclusion came forth. Figuring he needed another clue, I said, remember, imaginary means not real. No reaction. William, mama is real. Mama always called it the imaginary tooth fairy. Mama tucks you into bed. Mama has access to your pillow. Now think. <laughs> wonder how it was great the kids would finish kindergarten. <laughs> he stretched toward me again, furrowed his brow, and slowly intoned as if to the dim-witted, maybe the tooth fairy is real and you're not. <laughs> a split second later, he gave me a blink and a, this is a good joke. <laughs> Later, finished eating while waiting for me, he carefully cleaned the tooth. Holding it toward me, he said slowly, uncertain of his own wish, do you want it now? <laughs> no, William, gently I suggested, why don't you put it under your pillow tonight? <clears throat> Pleased with my answer, he once again looked at the tooth. Turning it round and round with his little fingers, he said to it in a voice I could hear, Santa Claus may not exist, but he's real to me. Even more gently, I said, Yes, William, that'll be fine. Children all over the world can have multiple realities, multiple fantasies, and multiple cultures. But if from the time they are this big, you ask them questions like, what is your favorite color? Who's your best friend? Which is the nicest teacher? What's the greatest game? You habituate them into believing that there is room for only one at the top, and that irrespective of how irrelevant the question is that they have only one favorite color. 
they will be so habituated into thinking that, and that then we want them to grow old and be multicultural? No, they're going to keep thinking they have to choose one because that's what's the right thing to do. So, listen carefully to each other as well as to your own several selves. And when you have to choose, try to pick the option that will close the fewest cultural doors, remembering that good laughter will often keep the doors from being locked and help develop preemptive resilience against the bad stuff. <laughs> Thank you.